So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our current program, the way that, you know, how things have, may have changed if you were here previously and what, what we currently are. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about motor learning and then a little bit about a couple examples of um, research projects by um, myself and our students um, and how that kind of fits in with, um, you know, the way that I see um, motor learning having, having evolved. So the movement science program, for those of you who um, either didn't know or not familiar with us, um, we're more than 100 years old. We were founded with the, um, with the college. And basically, we're the first graduate program in, in the US or even internationally to offer um, master's and eventually doctoral programs in physical education. Um, the founders of the field effectively were faculty at Teachers College. Um, and we were the first graduate program starting in the 1960s and 70s with a specialization in motor learning. Um, we have, a, obviously, a very distinguished um, group of alum. It's really nice to have some of you back. Um, in the most recent ranking, thank you. Um, the most recent rankings about uh, five years ago now, we were ranked number four out of uh, graduate programs or doctoral programs in kinesiology. And um, one thing that I think is, is particularly impressive is that we were number two in student quality and we were number one in terms of job placement in academics. So that's something that I think we can be really proud um, about. Um, what hurt our rankings is one is that um, we have a relatively large number of students relative to the size of the faculty. Um, but the other thing is that, you know, for those of you who were here back in the day, um, funding for students is poor. Um, you know, that's something that we still suffer and that was included in the rankings and that's something that, um, you know, they're making large efforts to change that, but it's still not anywhere near what we need it to be. Um, so I, basically we have about 95 students across all three areas um, with 27 in motor learning at the moment. These are our current faculty. Um, besides myself, um, we're actually down one faculty person with uh, Tara McIsaac uh, leaving about a year ago. She was in Ann Gentile's slot. Um, and we're hoping to get approval to recruit another faculty person. Um, uh, Steve Silverman sitting in the back here. He's our department chair and a distinguished professor of physical education. Um, you know, among many, many um, accomplishments, he was, uh, well, he has the best-selling uh, textbook in, in research methods, and he was the um, president of the National Academy of Kinesiology um, and editor for Research Quarterly. Um, <coughs> Laura Azarito, who unfortunately is not here, um, is relatively new. Uh, she's been here for three years. She just got tenure um, this week, actually, so we're really pleased to, yep, we're very happy to have, have that. She uh, brings in some qualitative methods and uh, uh, pedagogy that is, um, you know, a way of studying pedagogy I think it's very different than what we've had in, in the past. Uh, Carol Garber, who actually is, uh, along with her students, is going to be giving the uh, at 4.45, another concurrent session. So I'd encourage you to come to that. She's in exercise um, or applied physiology. And she is the um, incoming president of the American College of Sports Medicine. So it's, it's, she is a very um, high profile um, person in the field. And then a, a brand new uh, assistant professor in applied uh, physiology, Joe, as, as well as um, came with some grant funding to look at the role of exercise on things like smoking cessation and, and other aspects of benefits of exercise. Um, those of you who remember Terry, he's been you know, one constant that we have had. He comes to our research uh, seminar uh, every week. Um, basically, he has the same tough questions that many of you may have, have remembered and regarding like, well, so what? What's the point of this? You know, what, what are you trying to, to accomplish? Um, we're also pleased um, in Tara's absence, um, Dick McGill, who's sitting also in the, in the back, is a visiting professor with us um, in teaching the motor learning and motor development classes and some doctoral seminars and also involved in, uh, in our research training seminar. So we're pleased to having, have him here uh, this year and uh, at least through, through next year. Um, and then finally, um, we're really excited to have Lori Quinn, uh, basically who's moving back to New York and she's going to be involved as a, a visiting professor in some capacity and you know, we'll see how, how that works out. We really look forward to that. So. Okay, so most people here know um, about motor learning and, and what it is basically in terms of um, a set of processes involving practice and exercise leading to a relatively stable motor behavior. And you know, as Anne um, I think elegantly said, is that skill is the ability to consistently attain a goal, and I think goal being the, the key word here, with some economy of, of effort. And you know, Anne is really the you know, foundation of the program, the person that, um, that 
founded it. And, you know, some things that she really kind of ingrained into, um, you know, the therapy world or, you know, in physical education is that um, we shouldn't be misleading the learner um, by telling them how, uh, how to perform a movement, what form of, of movement, you know, let the person basically solve the problem themselves. Um, so you want to establish a goal, so it's really focused on goals, um, set up the regulatory stimulus conditions, the environment, and then let the person basically choose the movement pattern that they see um, best. And, you know, she obviously recognized that it's, you know, these common goals and tasks and activities of daily living, living that, um, that you know, our daily lives are directed towards, and um, basically we need to um, basically be focusing on, on that. And a big part of this, I think, is problem solving, letting... Uh, Learners, whether they're learning sports or you know coaching athletes or you know retraining uh, people with uh, various movement disorders, um, how to basically let them problem solve the best solution based upon their particular constraints. So there's lots of talk nowadays about translational science. Um, you know, it's the buzzword at NIH. It's a buzzword in most academic institutions. Um, way, way before that term existed, that's what this program has been about, basically not just studying learning or studying you know, how, how people learn or control movements, but applying that you know, to real world problems. And, um, and I think rehabilitation is, is one strong example of, of something that our graduates have done. And um, you know, my history of this isn't, you know, I wasn't here during this time, but you know, I think that with you know, Anne and her students, including Jim, really, really kind of you know, made a change in the way that rehabilitation uh, is, is provided for neurological and pediatric patients um, with the idea that the same principles that I just discussed with motor learning are being applied to, um, to patient care. And that's, this is now the dominant uh, form of rehabilitation or, or approach to rehabilitation. Um, the recognition that rehabilitation effectively involves motor learning. Um, in the pediatric uh, world, which I'm going to be focusing on, they're increasingly becoming aware of infants and children as active participants rather than um, passive uh, recipients of, of um, therapy. Um, so this really involves a triad um, between the person and the performance and the task. It's basically, that you want to set up the environment and basically you know, have people accomplish tasks with the recognition that you know, basically it's the person that ultimately is um, involved in this and that you're trying to elicit specific performance or motor skills. Okay. So let me give you a brief overlap, uh, overview of some of the work that we're doing, um, and I'll give you a couple uh, clear examples. Um, my work really cuts across three areas, one being more basic uh, systems, systems neuroscience, uh, work in motor control, basically understanding sensory motor transformations for grasp control, and a number of things just about how people control movement. Um, I also focus on understanding the neural mechanisms underlying movement disorders, particularly pediatric movement disorders in, in recent years, um, so that we can maybe target some of these for treatment approaches. And then ultimately developing and testing uh, treatment approaches based upon this information, and this basically feeds back into understanding mechanisms and then again trying to figure out what the disorders are. And so it creates a, a nice overlap um, between these, these different areas. So um, this was a interesting review article that came out um, last fall um, focusing on the efficacious, what, what um, interventions are, or have good evidence for implementation into clinical practice in pediatrics, particularly cerebral palsy. So the idea basically is um, the green circles represent there's good evidence and we can recommend this to be implemented, these, these approaches to rehabilitation to be implemented. Uh, Orange or amber basically is, you know, well, hold on, you know, maybe we need more evidence or more studies, but there isn't sufficient evidence really on a strong basis to implement these. And then red basically um, meaning don't do it. There's zero evidence, you know, to basically, um, okay. And it's controversial because people don't like to be in the red and the amber um, basically zones. So can anybody um, see any commonalities of what's in the green here? Any of our alum or current students? Anything that kind of underlies, brings us together? Yeah, yeah. So these are all um, basically approaches involving the participants being active learners and really using motor, I would say, motor learning based approaches. Um, and these are things that, um, so in, in our lab, um, uh, Jean Charles and 
Gail Lavender um, and myself were the first to publish a, a case study applying constraint therapy to the pediatric population. And this is really an area that's taken off in the basically the last uh, more than a decade. Um, Jean Charles also uh, a part of her doctoral or postdoctoral work with us, um, basically developed bimanual training or intensive form of bimanual training. Um, a lot of our work focuses on goal-directed training and context-focused uh, therapy. Um, and what you'll hear from Claudio is an example of home-based programs that you know applying this to uh, to the care of, of, of patients. So just briefly, many of you know about cerebral palsy. It's it's, a, it's the most common form of um, pediatric motor disability. Um, hemiplegia affecting one side of the body is the most common subtype. About 30% of individuals with CP have this form. Um, they have impaired movement execution. This is something that we've known from very early on. Um, one of our studies, we did a 13-year follow-up uh, study, and basically we showed, uh, contrary to what had previously been thought, that they have motor development. They continue to develop motor skills um, in parallel with typically developing kids, but basically they're offset. You know, they start off at, with, very early on with um, movement impairments, and although they will continue to develop and improve, they're not catching up to the kid, the typically developing kids. Um, some studies uh, early on, uh, including in, in, in our lab here, um, basically showed that they have impaired motor learning. <coughs> they, they take longer to learn motor tasks and, and motor planning. But I would say the key finding that kind of opened my eyes uh, was a study that we were doing with Sue Duff, um, when she was a doctoral student in the mid-1990s to late 1990s. And we had kids with CP coming in, and they were doing kind of basic motor control types of tasks. And you know, I, I really considered myself a motor control person as opposed to a motor learning person. But we noticed at the end of a one-hour session that the hands looked much better. You know, at one hour of just asking them to lift and grasp things, the hand looked much better than it did at the beginning of the hour. And that clued us into the fact that they have residual motor capabilities. We started doing learning studies. And with Sue, basically, we demonstrated that um, uh, they do learn, they just take much, much, much more practice than typically developing kids to learn the same types of motor tasks. So that clued us into the idea that we can provide intensive training protocols, um, perhaps to provide rehabilitation. Okay, so uh, Jean and Gail basically, uh, as I said, were the first to develop this constraint-induced um, movement therapy approach in the pediatric population. This was derived from animal studies, a deafferentation back in the 1960s, and then uh, the 1980s, uh, Steve Wolf and Taub in the 1990s developed forced use and constraint therapy for adults um, with adults with stroke, basically. Um, and uh, as I said, this is an area that has, has really um, taken off. It just involves restraining the, uh, the better hand and then forcing the kids into uh, using the more affected hand for motor activities. And, with the motor learning approach, you would scale the activities to their abilities and provide feedback and you know, all kinds of things that would um, allow them to move. And um, the way that, after that initial study, we developed day camps. Uh, basically, in uh, 2002 was our first day camp. We've had uh, 26 since then, uh, with more than 200 kids uh, who've participated either in constraint therapy as, or, as I will show you, by manual training. Basically, the idea is it has to be you know, child friendly. Uh, a group setting to be motivating. Uh, basically, a, a sl we use a cotton sling instead of uh, plaster casts that adults are, are often used. Um, and we really use the environment to perform you know, functional and play activities and uh, basically one-on-one -on -one, uh, student or interventionist per, per child and then home practice as well. Um, so this took off. And uh, a lot of people are, are, you know, are doing this and are still doing this. And, we got a bit discouraged because I think a lot of people interpreted this as, gee, we can just restrain kids and they'll get better. And that they were missing the, the boat in regards to what got kids better. So uh, with Gene Charles, we started to ask, you know, do we really need to restrain the arm? You know, can we do this in um, basically by manual training? And most people were very skeptical about that idea because, you know, if they have choice not to use the hand, they may well choose not to. And that means that we have to be so much more creative. Uh, you know, and, and control the environment and, you know, basically work with the kids to motivate them to, to use both hands. So we developed hand-arm bimanual intensive therapy, or HABIT. Um, basically, it's, it's similar to constraint therapy and in intensity, but you just provide activities that really necessitate the use of, of, both, um, uh, of both hands. 
Um, the idea is no restraint, um, same duration, again, by manual activities. And you can progress, you can think of it as a progression from a stabilizer, you know, starting with a paperweight, you know, while drawing, to maybe a passive or active assist, rotating the paper, you know, before, you know, drawing, you know, on that piece of paper. A manipulator might be, um, you know, basically to create a pattern and have them hold it up and, you know, start cutting with the other hand and then having to, you know, constantly, you know, reorient the paper. Um, and we think about, you know, basically um, how the hand is used in conjunction with the other hand. And we provide part practice or shaping and um, whole task practice. And um, we had a number of uh, small studies and then uh, basically showing the, the efficacy of, of um, constraint of, 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 um, by manual training. So just to give you an example, um, this was a study where we decided to compare um, in 42 kids uh, the bimanual training to constraint therapy to see, you know, are we losing anything here? Um, and this is the Jepson Taylor test of hand function. So it's a time battery that basically a faster, you know, a faster time means better performance for dexterity. Um, and basically you can see that after three weeks of bimanual or constraint therapy, both groups have about a 30% reduction in their time to complete these, these activities. And that this is maintained, this improvement is maintained over six months that we follow, followed them. So what's interesting is, um, okay, movement speed isn't the only thing that you need to obviously train, but I told you we, we did a developmental study. We did that over 13 years. The improvement that happens here in three weeks is double that of the natural development, which includes all kinds of you know, physical therapy, Botox, you know, surgeries, and so forth. So these are very large um, changes that we can get in a very short time period. Um, one difference, and this is something that Lily Hung, uh, who basically after, after graduating, uh, hung around and, and, and did some, um, some postdoctoral work with us. Um, we looked at this drawer opening task, basically, where you have to open a uh, drawer handle with one hand and manipulate the contents with the other hand. And the idea is that good performance involves uh, overlap of the two hands. You know, as one hand is reaching forward, the other is going right towards. So uh, typically, you typically developing adult would have about 80% overlap, meaning that both hands are moving constantly 80% of the total task time. These kids start off about 25%, so they really reach forward, open the drawer, and only as the drawer is getting complete, you know, being pulled open do they even initiate the, the movement towards the drawer. Um, after constraint therapy, they improve, but after the bimanual training, basically, um, they have um, you know, more than doubled the, um, the parallel performance of, of the two, two hands. So this is kind of an example of you know, where kinematics can really help capture things that these clinical tests um, don't necessarily do. And it does show specificity of, of training. Okay. Um, more recently, we started asking about ingredients of training. So we did a, a small trial of 24 kids um, looking at the role of structured practice. So basically, um, we took kids between the ages of 6 and 14 with hemiplegia. And they were divided into two groups. A structured practice group means that we were using environmental constraints to progress the difficulty of activities, providing positive feedback and reward and um, part, part practice and shaping and so forth. Um, kind of the general things that we do in constraint therapy and in the habit that I just um, showed you. The other group basically did the same activities, games for the most part, um, but it was by manual play. And the, the kids were told it was by manual play. And the therapists were actually students, some of them were therapists, were told this is a recreational camp. Do not try to progress the motor activities. They get enough therapy. This is just for fun. And we had a supervisor going around and observing interactions and recording uh, task progression and so forth um, to make sure that the fidelity of the, uh, between the two groups is maintained. Um, day camp environment, and you know, I'm not going to go through, but basically the evaluators and interventionists were all blinded. So we also did um, transcranial magnetic stimulation to look at how does the brain respond to these two different approaches to um, therapy. So TMS basically involves um, placing a magnetic wand um, over the, the, um, the skull and eliciting a slight magnetic pulse. And you measure at the, the fingers um, your muscle activity. And if you're, the place that you have the wand is located over neurons that basically connect to the hand, you'll get a little pulse of the fingers or little EMG um, activation. And that, that way, you can effectively map the parts of the brain that are connected to the hand. Um, 
this was done with Kathleen Friel, who um, now is an assistant professor at uh, Burke Cornell uh, um, Rehabilitation, um, and she's on a K Award with me. And um, Sherry Kuo was a doctoral student um, in, in our program. Okay. So in terms of the behavioral, this is the assisting hand assessment. It's just a videotaped assessment. It's a gold standard assessment for uh, quantifying uh, with blind uh, evaluators how well a child chooses to use their affected hand as a non-dominant assist. So a higher score is better. And basically both the play, the play group, the unstructured practice, and the structured practice improve about the same. They do lose some by six months, but it's still above, um, on average, the, um, the, the initial starting point. The Jebson-Taylor that I showed you in the previous slide, same thing. They get improvements, and on average, they're retained over six months. So to our surprise, after three weeks of training, maybe that shouldn't be a surprise because it's such a high intensity, um, both groups improve. So when we look at the brain uh, connectivity uh, to the affected hand, um, basically the <coughs> colored maps represent um, areas where we could elicit the motor evoke potential, the little twitching of the finger. Um, and the colors represent the intensity of that uh, potential. So red would be the highest intensity. So what you can see before and after treatment for the structured practice group, you, you get an expansion of the hand representation in the cortex. And you can see that there's much more red. You're getting much more powerful uh, you know, uh, motor evoke potentials, indicating stronger connectivity. Okay, so This is the unstructured practice group. And for the, on average, you get very similar types of responses, no overall change. And across all the kids, so basically you get an increase in the motor evoke potential size and amplitude after skill training only. And for all the, across all the kids that we tested, um, for the structured skill training, we get about a 50% expansion in the motor cortical representation. Um, but for the unstructured practice group, there's none. So plasticity as defined in this particular measure isn't being, you know, this isn't capturing what's happening with the changes in motor performance. And this is true basically for even the amplitude of the motor evoked potential. Now there is one difference in the group that I didn't mention, and that's skill learning. So this is the um, Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. It's a parent's uh, perception of changes in goal performance that they and the children have, have had. And basically, uh, parents perceive that the kids in the skill training group have a larger um, amount of improvement on the goals that they set than the kids that were in the basically the play groups. And the reality is that's because we let the kids practice these goals in a skill training group. And practicing skills or goals is, is basically motor learning. And this correlates very nicely with the animal literature, um, basically showing that it's really changes in uh, skill performance that elicits changes in plasticity. So it's really motor learning. Just briefly, um, this technique can be used to map out the organization of the brain. Um, so in some children with CP, um, if you uh, elicit, if you provide a stimulus on one side of the cortex, you'll get a response in the contralateral hand and, you know, because the right brain controls the left hand and vice versa. But for some portion of the kids, there's a brain reorganization in response to their early injury. So in this case, one side of the brain doesn't control anything and the other side of the brain has connectivity to both hands. Um, and it's actually been proposed that these two groups respond differently to constraint therapy. So we actually tested this possibility. So it turns out that kids who have this ipsilateral connectivity um, in terms of their Jepson-Taylor um, test of, of motor, motor performance, they do have improvement um, in dexterity after constraint therapy. Um, but kids that maintain the normal contralateral projections have a much larger improvement. Conversely, kids with the ipsilateral innervation improve more following bimanual training than kids that have this normal contralateral projection. So this looking at plasticity, looking at connectivity, can start to hone in and predict which type of treatment approaches might be best for which kids. And that's important because these are very time-consuming, expensive treatment approaches, um, and we need to be able to take best guesses at who's going to benefit the, the most from this. This is relatively small uh, sample sizes at this, this point, and um, we have a, a grant uh, with very specific hypotheses about the different mechanisms. But I'm not gonna, we don't have time to go into them, but basically we have a, a very clear-cut um, 
theoretical basis for uh, how to proceed with larger numbers and you know, basically how this is differentially, uh, the brain is differentially affecting the, um, the performance under these two restraint types. Um, I just want to say briefly that um, we started to expand this to lower extremity training with a, a group in um, Brussels, Yannick Blanhoft, and uh, basically um, we've taken kids with hemiplegia and with much better outdoor space. Um, basically, we were able to stimulate both the upper and lower body with these, you know, a lot of gross motor activities as well as fine motor activities. Um, and we've had very, very positive results, you know, kind of applying this intensive model, motor learning based model to include lower uh, extremity as, as well. Um, we also started um, uh, Bavini is one of our current student, and Alexis is also a student. And basically, we started applying these approaches to kids who have bilateral CP. Much more. So we've taken so far the easiest group of kids, you know, the most mild form of CP, with relatively good hand function. Yep, we can get some improvements. Well, what happens to kids who need walkers or have, you know, we haven't gotten to wheelchair confined yet, but we're heading in that direction. Um, but basically, kids who are much more severe and I think unfortunately are left behind in much of the rehabilitation uh, world. So um, we applied the same sort of uh, motor learning based approach, kind of combined stimulating the, um, the lower body by you know, having even the seating arrangements so that they had to maintain balance and um, basically lots of things that you know, dynamically perturb their balance and uh, basically in the context of upper extremity um, movement performance or, and so forth. Um, and I'm just going to quickly show you, um, so basically for the six minute walk test, um, you can see that there's a, you know, about a 20% improvement um, over the three weeks for kids with bilateral CP using this training approach. Um, in terms of the GMFM, it's just a measure of gross motor function. Um, you know, we also get some decent in improvements. Um, to my knowledge, actually, these are among the largest that have been shown in single intervention approaches. Um, so we're really excited about this possibility. Um, we had one 13-year-old girl who we had the opportunity to actually do this um, over two successive summers. So basically, we brought her in in 2012 and 2013. Um, same thing, one-on-one, six, -on -one, six hours a day for uh, basically three weeks with a focus on both upper and lower motor function. And this is the uh, six-minute walk test. And you can see that she had a six-fold increase the first time that you know, basically she participated. We bring her back a year later. Um, she's lost some function compared to where she left off, but still is much better off than she had you know, at, at the end of that, uh, the beginning of that pretest. Um, and we give her another bout of treatment, and you can see further approaches. So this is really kind of coming together to say that you know, intensity really matters. You know, that's what we learned in our motor learning studies early on and you know, looking at CP in terms of application of these treatment approaches. You know, maybe the ingredients are less important than the intensity, or, or maybe if you provide enough intensity, the, the ingredients become less important. Um, I want to just show you two examples um, of this girl. This video works. Um, okay, so this is her pretest before her first camp. This is her post-test after her first camp. So you can see we can make some fairly good changes in function. Um, you know, she's still a bit insecure, and that's what our second summer focused on, is just building confidence and practicing falls and developing strategies to maintain balance and so forth. But um, you can see that just providing intensive bursts of intervention, probably way more intensive than you know, our healthcare systems provide you know, in terms of therapy, um, often to getting at best two, three times a week of half an hour to 45 minutes. 90 hours of treatment probably is like a year and a half of, of therapy condensed into, in, in, compressed into a, a three week period. So this really says that um, you know, this might be a better approach to consider um, in, in the long term. And the question is, well, how do you replicate this in large models and get rehabilitation to kind of you know, follow this thing? And um, we think home training might be one approach and Claudia is gonna be talking about that in a, in a minute. Okay, so just to wrap up, you know, Anne used to kind of tell this, you know, the, the old joke about how you get to Carnegie Hall and, you know, basically it's practice, practice, practice. Um, and it's specificity of training. You really want to train what it is that you're trying to learn or improve. Then intensity really matters. You know, that if I get known for any one thing in my life, it'll be that, you know, I just 
went out and just applied lots and lots of intensity, and you know we lucked out and, and had nice results as a, as a consequence. But um, intensity is necessary, but in and of itself, it's insu insufficient. We do, do need to know the ingredients, and we do need to know you know what kids basically respond best to what type of approach and so forth. Um, and that's really what our lab and uh, much of the field is directed towards. Um, you know, I think that we can say that you need to go beyond clinical outcome measures, and this program has always been, you know, one that pushed for, you know, very detailed analysis of movement using kinematics and forces and so forth, um, and that's something that we have uh, the strength to, to do. Um, and basically, it's, we think that it is the uh, goal-oriented or task, you know, approach that really is the key to um, training or involving motor learning. Okay. So, there are large numbers of people. We have huge bodies of students that are contributing to this. Um, some of them are doctoral students, some of them are master's students. We get lots of volunteers from lots of programs and even from undergraduates from different places in, at Columbia and outside of, uh, outside of the city. Um, Kathleen Friel um, as, is the person that was involved with the TMS. Yannick Blainhoff in Brussels. Dido Green is a very clever OT uh, researcher in, um, uh, in, in England, kind of using a magic-themed uh, bimanual training approach. Jean Charles um, basically was involved with the early conceptualization of constraint and bimanual training. Bert Steenbergen in the Netherlands, and Lily Hung is another uh, one of our alum. And then, of course, our, our students, and Marina um, Brandau is a, is a uh, OT researcher from Brazil. So, thanks. OK, it's really a treat to get to tell you a little bit about some of the dissertation, or my, some of the doctoral studies work that I've been doing here. Um, and specifically, I'll talk to you a little bit about an intensive home-based uh, bimanual training for children with hemiplegia. And um, Andy already mentioned some of these evidence-based approaches um, that have sort of been given the green light, controversial green light. Um, and I'll, I'll focus specifically on the bimanual training and um, a home-based setting. And so after um, seeing these data Andy presented on the camp-based models, you might ask yourself, well, why do we need an alternative to the camp-based models? Um, and the most logical response is that TC doesn't offer funding for their doctoral students, and so we need a project that we can be finished in a realistic time frame. Um, but seriously, why, why do we need an alternative to the camp-based models? Uh, so one of the consistent findings in the literature is that um, the biggest predictor of improvement is intensity. And so our camps last 90 hours, and the kids are here for six hours a day, five days a week. And you can see how that could be really challenging um, for a young uh, children, especially children below the ages of four years, uh, four, four years. Um, specifically the fatigue associated with being here six hours a day, separation anxiety, uh, and also just sort of maintaining the, the concentration that's important for um, doing some of these activities. Um, but ultimately what's important is that these camps are costly and logistically they're very challenging. So it's really tough for families to come from out of state and spend three weeks uh, in New York. Um, and ultimately the goal I'm not sure what's that. Ultimately, the goal is to be able to provide these uh, uh, interventions in a wide-scaled manner. Um, and so what we've done is we've modified the bimanual training that Andy uh, described to you um, in a distributed practice model. And so it's still 90 hours of training, but it's two hours a day, five days a week for nine weeks. And the other big adaptation is that instead of us doing the activities, we've actually trained caregivers uh, to be interventionists and perform the activities in their own home. And so when I say that we train caregivers, it's not that we train them and send them off for nine weeks to do 90 hours of activities on their own, but we consider it a very team-based approach. And so all along the way, we're supervising and providing ideas for activity and helping them come up with a very individualized program specific to the needs of that, uh, that specific child. Um, and so we do these weekly home visits. Um, and like I said, ultimately the goal is to target a broader range of the population. Um, and so our first question was, well, is this actually a feasible model? Can we train caregivers to do these activities? Will they complete the entire intervention? Um, and do the kids show improvement? And so we did a, a small pilot study of 10 children between the ages of two and a half and four and a half years of age. Um, and this is kind of a busy slide, but I'll just tell you about the design. We uh, did two uh, baseline measures separated by a week. And then we had the caregivers come in over three separate sessions for training. Um, so in the first session, they came in without the child, and we basically gave them a background of CP, of how to do bimanual activities, um, sort of some of the research we've done here at our center. And then in the second session, they came in with the child, and we modeled the activities for them. Um, and then in that same session, we actually swapped places and would provide feedback to the parent as they were doing the activities. Um, and we sort of kind of came up with activities and ideas to target specifically the needs of that child. 
And the third session was actually the beginning of the home intervention and actually occurred in the child's home. And we would go and for an hour, we would kind of get a sense of where they were doing the activities, specifically in the home, what activities the family already owned. And we came up with sort of a plan to think of um, what types of movements can we elicit in these activities that the family already owns, kind of keep it cost effective. And then they did 90 hours of intervention and came back for a follow-up assessment and a six-month uh, assessment. Um, and so I just want to give you uh, a quick clip of sort of how these activities look. And specifically, I want you to focus on sort of the instruction that the parent is giving the child, uh, specifically about the goal of the task, and also how she's structuring the environment in a way that it's encouraging use of the affected hand. So. So the clip's in Russian, but you can kind of get a sense at the end there that the child, and usually when researchers show an example or a video clip, they show their best example or the one where it's working beautifully. And I like to show this example because it kind of reminds us that at the end of the day, these are kids and they have very strong personalities. And so one of the things we're trying to do is balancing their personalities with sort of some of the activities that we can actually get them motivated to do. Um, so in terms of feasibility, we had two measures. Um, the first was the parenting uh, stress index, which is a me measure of uh, parental stress related to the amount of caregiver and child interaction. And so we were really concerned that here we are introducing a very intensive intervention and we don't want to disrupt this very delicate psychosocial dynamic between the child and their caregiver. Um, and then we also uh, had the caregivers fill out daily logs that they would uh, submit remotely. And the purpose of these logs was so that we could track the activities and also uh, they included questions about, well, how feasible was it to fit those daily activities into that specific day's schedule, uh, did the child tolerate the training, were they attentive? Um, and then our second aim, of course, was efficacy, and we looked at the assisting hand assessment, which Andy just described, but it's a measure of bimanual performance, and the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, which is a caregiver-rated uh, perception of how children are performing functional goals, goals that the parents actually established themselves before the intervention. Um, so this is the data from the Parenting Stress Index, and we had two baseline measures. We took another one at the midway point and one at the post-test. And higher scores indicate uh, greater stress. But what's important about this graph, if you look at the blue line, that's the average of the 10 families, caregiver stress remains stable throughout the entire duration of the intervention. Um, each of these individual bars represents an individual child, and it's the number of hours they completed. And about half the parents completed all 90 hours, but on average, the caregivers completed 87, 87 hours of the intervention. And so the parents are actually meeting the requirements of sort of what we set for them to do. Um, these are frequency of responses to the different questions that were included in the daily log. Um, so how easy it was to carry out the training? Did they fit it into their schedule? Did the child tolerate the training? And how attentive the child was? And for the most part, parents find it to be easy. They are able to fit it into their schedule. The child tolerates the training and they appear to be attentive. Um, the other really cool thing that we found from the daily logs is that parents are incredibly creative and they came up with a pretty broad range of tasks. And that kind of makes our job easy because then we can find tasks or activities that the kids really enjoy and kind of capitalize on that and think of movements and give suggestions to parents in the context of these activities that kids really like. Um, these are data for the assisting hand assessment. So these are two baseline measurements, the post-test and six months after. And so they, um, again, higher scores indicate uh, better bimanual performance and it's stable across the two baselines and it shows a nice linear improvement uh, following the intervention which is maintained at six months. Um, these are the two uh, sub-scores of the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure. Again, this is another uh, measure where higher scores indicate uh, greater caregiver satisfaction and performance, and it shows a nice improvement between the baseline and the post-test, and that's maintained at the six months. Um, so what can we conclude about this feasibility study? Well, parental stress appears to remain stable, so it looks like we're not disrupting um, the psychosocial dynamic between the caregiver and the child too greatly. Uh, caregivers, for the most part, complete all 90 hours of the intervention, and for the most part, they able to fit it into their schedule and the children tolerate the activities. Um, and what was really important is that we saw an improvement in the performance of bimanual activities 
and the measures of goal performance. And so the next step, and what will be actually my dissertation study, is a randomized control trial, so testing this intervention against a control group that receives uh, an intervention of equal duration and intensity. And um, so children are randomized to receive either 90 hours of home-based habit or 90 hours of a functional lower limb training. Um, and the novel component of this study is also that we're including telerehabilitation. And so kind of keeping in line with what I mentioned earlier about being able to target a broad range of the population, um, we want to be able to include families from out of state, from out of the city. And so it's not really easy for me to travel around that often once a week um, to visit these families and do home visits. And so we're actually supervising the activities remotely using um, Adobe Connect. And the other component of this is that we actually train some of the caregivers to do some of the assessments. And that way, they're only having to come in one time um, to actually receive the training. And then we actually score these video recorded uh, assessments after we're guiding the parents through how to do them. Okay. Um, so obviously, the, the question is th uh, for this specific study is do children in the home habit group improve in terms of quality of bimanual performance, uh, functional goal, goal performance, and dexterity in comparison to children in the control group? And these are, uh, oh, I'm sorry, so we, um, we use a very similar design where we train caregivers over three um, sessions initially, and they do 90 hours of training, and we test them before and after in six months. Um, and these are very preliminary data from nine kids that have already completed the study, um, and this is the uh, box and blocks test. So it's a time measure of dexterity. It's basically how many blocks children can move in one minute and, uh, with the affected hand. And so these are the number of blocks at the three different assessment points. And you see that the control group remains pretty stable. Uh, across the two baseline measurements, the habit group also shows stability, but they show a nice improvement uh, following the intervention. Um, so these are some really encouraging preliminary results for us. And so we're currently uh, recruiting uh, the rest of the cohort for this. Um, so what can we conclude about home-based bimanual training? Well, it appears to be a feasible model. Um, but one thing I really want to stress is that um, we don't really see this as a replacement to the summer camp models, but really it's an additional tool in sort of the toolbox of therapies and interventions that clinicians can use. And there are also some, um, obviously it, it does help to, to kind of provide an alternative to the day camp models because of um, some of the, the drawbacks in terms of the cost and the, the logistics of, of the day camps. Um, but there are also some drawbacks to the home-based study. And so uh, at the end of the day, parents aren't therapists. And so it's regardless of what they're reporting in terms of feasibility, it's really uh, a challenging uh, intervention for them to complete. Um, and it also, it, we want to avoid impacting this, this sort of dynamic between the caregiver and the child. Um, but I think what's really cool is that across all these interventions, some of the interventions that Andy described, and we were fortunate enough to see Dr. Lori Quinn present her uh, research on uh, Huntington's disease, is that Use, we can use these motor learning principles to design very uh, task-specific and activity-based interventions um, to, to get really nice improvements in terms of uh, function. Um, so I just want to say thanks to my dissertation committee, Andy, who's my advisor, and Georgia Malandraki, and all the people that were involved in uh, designing this study. So, yeah, thanks. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello. It's kind of uh, getting to the end of the afternoon. Everybody may be. I'm just going to say a few things in a very general sense. This is exciting. Uh, I, uh, I wanted to say a few things, give a historical perspective a little bit. But Andy did a nice job with that, but I'll just make a few points. Uh, when, when I came to TC uh, 34 years ago, uh, we were, it was a very exciting time. It was very exciting. And we were part of a, uh, a community of people uh, who really had a purpose. And our purpose was to really uh, develop better ways to treat patients with neurologic disorders. And w at that time, we had what I think we could think now are fairly primitive methods for, for doing that. And, uh, and it was our mission, really, to, on the one hand, uh, really demonstrate that there need to be better ways and that these primitive methods needed to be, uh, to be put aside. And on the other hand, find those better ways. And, uh, and so uh, TC attracted all of these really uh, interesting people to come for this process. 
And of course, the leader was Anne Gentile. I mean, we are, I think, in all, in an intellectual sense, we are all children of Anne Gentile. And uh, she had a vision about this. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, uh, I think this is an important lesson, is that it worked. It really did work. And as, as Andy said, I think we've come a long way. And uh, what started here at TC, and we weren't the only ones doing this. There were other centers. There were other people who had similar ideas. But we were one of the leading centers, and it worked. You know, 30 years later, we have come a very long way. And we have integrated these principles in many respects into our practice. And we should feel very proud of that. Um, but we should also remember uh, we haven't solved the problem. And I mean, who, who here thinks that we have solved the problem of uh, rehabilitation patients with stroke or cerebral palsy? We are obviously a long way for that. And obviously, we're really at the beginning of that. So the question is, and the the title of the, of the workshop is The Way Forward. So how do we move forward? And the, these, I think these uh, presentations we've had really demonstrate the difference between where we were 30 years ago and where we are now, that we are really testing specific interventions and really uh, taking those, those principles that we were just kind of trying to work out and elaborate and putting them into real meaningful treatments. Uh, so I think, however, the next step is for us to begin to have a framework for us to, be, to look at all of these different results and to say, how, how, do, how do we generalize the lessons that we're learning from these into some principles that we can use to, uh, to, to tell therapists what to do? And, uh, and one, uh, one, I think, exciting development of that is there's a very recent series of papers that came out in Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehab and also in the PT Journal uh, on uh, developing what's called a taxonomy of rehabilitation treatment approaches. And John White and Tessa Hart and other people, John White is at uh, Moss Rehab, have really done a lot of nice theoretical work. And I really highly recommend these papers. I, don't, I didn't bring the reference, but it's uh, a very recent uh, edition of the PT Journal and a whole issue of archives. Uh, I think it was January or February. Yeah. And, you know, uh, John White is W H Y T E, easy to find. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to talk about that because it's clear that we have within that framework the, the potential to start looking at what we're doing. And, in that framework, by the way, uh, they talk about treatment theories. And a, a treatment theory consists really of three things. It, it consists of understanding what the ingredients of the treatment are, on the one hand. On the other end, what the target of the treatment is. And in between, what the mechanism of action is. So really having, and we heard discussion of those very points in these two lectures. So we need to develop theories now from these treatments that, that uh, uh, enable us to sort of understand what are the common ingredients, what are the essential ingredients, what are the ingredients that are nice to have but aren't essential, uh, those kinds of things. Critically, what's the mechanism of action? Because it's the mechanism of action that allows us to, to generalize it to other kinds of treatments. And that's one type of theory. But they, what's really interesting about this uh, taxonomy is that they also talk about what they call enablement theories. And enablement theories are theories, are ways of, of telling us, well, OK, if the target of our treatment is to have a child be able to move more skillfully and, and, more, and faster and more accurately to pick up objects, so what? what does the, what good does that child, what, good, does the, what does that enable the child to do at higher levels of function and activity and participation levels? So we need to also be, and of course Anne Gentile would always remind us that that needed to be 
part of what we were doing. So in the enablement theory part of it is another critical aspect that enables us to, to understand the critical question of how these treatments, okay, so now the child is better at picking up blocks in the Jebson test or whatever, what does that generalize to them being able to play, you know, in a playground or uh, in school or wherever? So we need those two kinds of theories and we need to be subjecting our treatments, our studies and our treatments to that kind of analysis because there are some big problems for us to solve still. It's evolving. So with strength therapy, one of the limitations is that the child has to have a hand that is completely usable, you know, to elicit enough activities to, you know, engage them. So typically that means some form of graft, some, you know, wrist extension, finger extension is what has been used in adults with stroke, and, you know, it's questionable whether that carries over to the kids. Um, when you think about bimanual training, you're training a non-dominant hand in a more, you know, in the context in which ultimately they need to be able to use it. So that means, you know, they need to be able to move the arm for sure. They need to be able to apply some pressure, for example, on a piece of paper. Maybe have some, you know, very, very rudimentary grasp, not necessarily release. Um, but you don't need to have the same level of, of movement. So in theory, you could go to a more severely affected uh, population so that they can just figure out ways in which they can, you know, problem solved by manual activities more so than you would ever be able to do. Um, thank you, Andy. I really enjoyed your talk. And pediatric literature is not the literature that I usually look at. So I have some questions about um, when you were doing a transdiabetic skin of the children right after your intervention, showing the differences between the kids that had the you know the structure versus the we're just going to play, right? The intervention versus we're just going to play. Um, and showing very lovely that red dot, you know, mm -hmm. like that, that was very exciting. I'm, uh, the question that I have is, did you look at them again at six months to see if the red dot was still? So yes. clearly you, yeah, you did. You did. Uh, whatever it's, they gain, they maintain. They, yeah. Not just through your outcome measures on the, on the movement level or on the action level. Really yes, so the represent, hand representation yes. expansion was maintained um, you know, okay. after six months that we followed them. Okay, so now I, that's, uh, thank you. And then there's another question that I have, and that is, in the adult literature, people are following the patients longitudinally to show, you know, um, ipsilateral activation and then the moving over to the control. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that at all, or...? Um, no, so what's different in the pediatric, um, their injury occurred much, you know, right. usually in the utero or, um, and in fact, the earlier that it happened, the better the um, outcome. But in the, in the kids that have injury, either uh, typically right before birth, um, they have that reorganization so that the epilateral cortex controls the, both extremities. And that doesn't shift. Um, no, we've yet to see a case where, um, there's been a shift in the representation or connectivity. Um, we've seen definitely shifts in, in thresholds it takes to elicit, especially for kids who have bilateral. I, I didn't show that there's, there's a mixed, you know, basically group as, as well. But um, yeah, just because of their response to the injury at a very early point that allows changes in connectivity, they have patterns that you typically don't, you don't usually see many stroke patients that have ipsilateral innervation. Yeah, or doesn't show. Yeah, I've got a question about work, what the child's doing. Um, I think for parents and children, how little time do I need to put in to get some changes? And I think you, you did a nice thing to go to two hours, five days a day, five, mm -hmm. five days a week. And I know in your uh, on-site things, you measure how many performances, you shape, mm -hmm. scale. Um, can you share some of the challenges of trying to see within these two-hour sessions how many repetitions is the child doing? You showed in one, the first slide, the first mm -hmm. video, and you, know, you can't assume that for two hours, you get two hours of, of working time. And I understand using a window of time to 
to see with this time frame we're getting changes, but um, I'm sure you've grappled with do you measure repetitions versus windows of time and, and uh, is, there a, is there a way of knowing what the two hours would come down to one hour if I did an intense high repetition activity as opposed to two hours of more self-chosen repetition? And maybe share the dilemma there of how do we identify you know, the salient amount of practice we need to get a certain amount of changes? So let me just start by, I'll answer that from the camp perspective and then maybe I'll let, I'll let Claudio kind of answer the home program. Um, so dosing is extremely complicated. And we've taken the most conservative approach and said, let's blast them with practice and see if we get you know, changes. And then you can always you know, withdraw that and see what the critical amount of dosage is. And the reality is, is there's no way it's going to be the same across individuals. Um, the big problem that we found across, we haven't done dosing studies per se, but we've compared camps where we've had 60 hours of training versus 90 hours of training. And the, basically, um, in most cases, the um, 90 hours is better. But in some cases, what you see is actually, a, if you um, look at the initial response, 60 hours and 90 hours will elicit the same response. But then you bring them back uh, six months later, the 90 hours maintains it, the 60 hours actually begins to lose it. So when you're thinking about dosing studies, you can't titrate it the same way you would do with pharmaceuticals, where you give a you know, certain amount and see if they respond, and give a little bit more and see if they respond. Um, it's the retention, ultimately, that you need to, and that's it's much more difficult. Um, I, I just want to let Claudio respond to the um, home training part. Yeah, so as far as tracking the repetitions, it's really challenging because one of the biggest challenges is finding this balance between how much we want the parents to actually document and how much time we're actually taking up. So two hours is already a lot. Um, one thing I can say, though, is that when we were doing the weekly home uh, visits, and even now that we're doing the tele-rehabilitation, so one hour a week, um, we actually supervise the activities, and all those sessions are actually recorded. And so one thing we've kind of played around with is going back and doing some behavioral scoring of what is it exactly that the two hands are doing during this one hour. Um, obviously, the, the supervised hour probably won't be a good representation of what's happening, you know, the other 89, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, nine hours a week, but it can kind of give us an indication of, well, are the parents doing a good job of keeping both hands active, how many repetitions are we listening, and what's the role each hand is playing? There? I was just thinking when you were just saying it's very difficult with the dosing and I'm remembering you either control for the time or you control for the repetitions but you right. can't control for both right. and I'm remembering um, uh, a study that we actually, not I did, but um, She's from Scranton, and I can't remember her name. Maria, oh, yeah. Maria yeah. Ziccatelli yeah. with the yeah. AFO. Yeah. And yep. it wasn't the repetition, it was the time and the failure and the, mm -hmm. like all of that. So yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you did go back and behaviorally score what happens in the, in the, in the session. If it's, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful question, mm -hmm. but I think it's the time. Well, it's, it's just it's testable. The, you know, yeah. but it is testable, but mm -hmm. I think it's the time. Yeah, so we... Question. We have looked at, um, in the camp-based model, the relationships between um, time on task and outcome. And in particular, um, Jean tried to create a surrogate for attention, you know, as, as an idea, approximation of what they're doing during the camp. And she basically videotaped the assessments and then had a blind evaluator score the number of times that the child had to be redirected to do what they're supposed to do. Um, and it turned out that the outcomes were, you know, incredibly predicted by the um, number of times they had to be redirected. So attention mattered. And you know, if you went back to the camp, you could assume that the same thing would have happened there, that it, kids who needed to be redirected had less practice. Um, so I, I think that that's an important issue. We've got lots and lots of data. We, you know, Mike said we track everything, but it's so much data we don't have the person power to possibly go and you know, to analyze it. You know, we, we get armies of international students actually come through sometimes for three months at a time. And, Sometimes we give them little projects like that, but it just barely gets a bite out of that. I don't know if you want to say something about the whole No, no, I think it's, it's definitely an interesting question, and you know, one we're really curious about, but like you, like you said, it's the one hour of behavioral scoring, um, or one hour of the actual session, maybe takes three to four hours to be, to be behaviorally scored. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really challenging. Yes. Mm -hmm.